This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Adding an additional 10 healthy and productive years to your life is an irresistible idea. And the lifestyle choices needed to achieve this milestone may be easier than you think. The secrets and why a local health organization wants to turn Northwest Florida blue. We're in the zone, the blue zone, on this edition of In Studio. There are certain places in the world where the populations live longer, healthier, and more productive lives than the rest of us. These areas of the globe have been labeled blue zones. On this edition of In Studio, we'll discuss what the inhabitants of blue zones are doing differently than the rest of us. Some of their lifestyle choices may be easier to adopt than you think. Locally, Baptist Healthcare wants to transform Northwest Florida into a blue zone. Our guests are at the forefront of this movement. Megan McCarthy has a vast amount of experience in healthcare mixed with a solid business background. Her specialty is worksite wellness programs. In 2014, she was named one of the nation's top 100 wellness professionals by the Wellness Council of America. Currently, McCarthy is Director of Community Health and Wellness for Baptist Healthcare. You might say Dr. Paul Glisson is passionate about data. But it would probably be more accurate to say he is passionate about what data can do to improve the lives of patients. Dr. Glisson is the Quality Physician Advisor and Chief Medical Informatics Officer with Baptist Healthcare. He is also Board Chair for Strategic Health Initiative, as well as being a member of HealthStream's team of physician coaches. We welcome Megan McCarthy and Paul Glisson, Dr. Paul Glisson, to In Studio. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks Thank you for, for having us. For having us. Blue zones, what are they? Well, your introduction gave me chills. It, it, you described it very, very well. So basically, there was a National Geographic Explorer who was traveling around the world, and he would look around, and he felt like he would see 105-year-olds surfing and 103-year-old uh, women gardening. And he basically said, I think that there is something here. So National Geographic brought in researchers, scientists, all those things, and they went in to back up that data. And they found that there were areas in the world where people actually were living longer, healthier lives. The fascinating thing is that they're all over the globe. So they're not exactly the same. There's not one diet, there's not one plan. But so the natural question was, what do these areas have in common? And more importantly, can we reverse engineer it into create blue zones? Dr. Glisson, um, why does Baptist Healthcare want to be involved in this for Northwest Florida? Well, Baptist Healthcare is in the business of taking care of our community, and that's what we want to do. So if by the time you come to the doors of the hospital or the front door of the emergency department, it's probably too late, right? We're already way behind the eight ball. So what we want to do is be forward thinking and get out in front of these issues and try to make people healthier from the get go. And then that makes everyone's jobs a lot better. People live a lot, lot more happy and productive life. So mm -hmm. that's the part of it. An ounce of prevention goes a long way, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. You were talking about there are certain uh, certain amount of commonality of what these blue zones um, mm -hmm. uh, share. W mm -hmm. What are some of those common things? Well, I think the first one I always think about is nutrition and food. So yeah. these areas had different diets depending on where they were. So in Japan, they're going to eat tofu, where in Greece, they're probably not eating that. But what they have in common is they eat a low processed food diet. So their food they're getting from local areas, it's not going to have a lot of additives. Whereas we're seeing here in America, our food distribution system, we're eating more and more processed foods. So certainly that's one area to start with, that if it comes out of a bag or a box, it's probably not going to be in line with the Blue Zones, uh, Blue Zones diet. Okay. Dr. Glisson, when, when you take a look at patients, because you I also, I didn't, I didn't mention in the intro, but you also work about, what, at least once a week still as, as a practicing physician in the emergency room, right? That's correct. What are some of the uh, health-related issues that you see that it's just very obvious to you, you know what, this could be prevented just by a, a little prevention, so to right. speak, or, or a little, shall I say, let me restructure it, by a little healthy eating or something along those lines? Right. The big ones we see, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. They are just outright preventable. So uh, if we put just a little bit of effort in this, like Megan was talking about, diet would, would address both you know, all three of those issues up front. So uh, I, something else, the education would go a long ways in our community. You, you mentioned diabetes. I want to piggyback on that for a second because mm -hmm. it just seems like 
every time you turn around you hear more and more people have diabetes and not only in the United States but it seems like it's spreading to different parts of the world that the, right. the, the why is that right as well, our bad eating habits travel so do the, so does diabetes you know if you watch TV these days mostly you see about the new medicines ask your doctor about this medicine ask your doctor about this medicine why don't they ever say ask your doctor about my diet that's something we could do ask my doctor what I should go to the grocery store when I should be buying what kind of food should I be eating those are the type of things we want to shift the conversation and we point to those kind of things and not worry about so much about medicine because by then it's too late. Right. And, and I do, I want you to clarify too because there's a big difference between what we're talking about type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes, right? Correct. Yes, actually, and, and type 1 is, is child onset and uh, ch type 2 is just the years and years of bad eating habits and lifestyle changes that have really added up. On, so. So, so type 1 is not that's something that you can control per Correct, se. right, that's, that's childhood onset. Right, right. right. And you right. can't reverse type 1, but you right. can reverse type 2. Exactly. You can reverse you type 2? You can two? reverse exactly. type 2. So what you're telling me is <laughs> if I become a diabetic, if I'm classified or diagnosed as being diabetic, I can actually go backwards and become no Correct. longer be a diabetic? Yeah, the first conversation your doctor should have with you is let's talk about your diet. Yeah. Right? And then let's talk about exercise because all those are additive as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the conversation just gets to, well, I'm not going to change my diet. I, it's too hard, although it's not, but it's too hard. So let's get on these medicines or let's you know, and progress to where we're using insulin or these pills every day. And right. some, some patients we see are on several oral uh, uh, diabetic medicines uh, a, a day, but don't really address the, the easy thing, which is just picking out healthy foods and uh, making smart choices at the grocery store. And ideally, you would go in and see your primary care physician, and they would identify when you're in a pre-diabetic range. And then you could start doing those interventions before you even get to that step. And that's one of the reasons right. why it's so important for people to see a primary care physician and have one that they, that they love, <laughs> really, that they're willing to talk to in those things. Because that's where it's a much easier lifestyle change and we go too far down the road. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times we use healthcare as sick care. So we only go to the doctor or we access the healthcare system when we're sick. And, you know, when we think about kids, you would um, never skip your two-year-old's well visit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But we somehow turn 18 and we kind of, all the rules go away. Like, oh, I don't need the doctor. Right. I'm not going to do any of those preventative things anymore. Um, and we really need to carry those things on throughout the lifestyle if we're really going to live healthier, longer lives. How often should a healthy person go to the doctor? Well, once a year is always a great idea. Now, if you look at the CDC requirements or uh, their recommendations, they have different things for different disease states, for instance, colon cancer screening and those type of things, but it's never a bad idea to have a yearly checkup. Mm -hmm. At Baptist, we mandate a, and Megan can talk to us a lot more than I can, that that's under her purview there, but we mandate a healthy uh, health wellness screening. Mm -hmm. So we check those things and we check for if you're in a pre-diabetic state. It's just part of your being an employee at Baptist Healthcare, so we wanna make sure you're healthy. And you can catch these things way early. We also check, uh, cholesterol screenings, mm -hmm. weight screenings, and we really talk to patients about, or our, our employees, about weight. And mm -hmm. if you are over 26 BMI, uh, we have a frank conversation with you and say, what can we do to get this? What kind of exercise are you doing? These are our exercise alternatives we can do. Uh, what kind of healthy li lifestyle changes can we make? Can we take the elevator, I mean, I'm sorry, take the staircase instead of the elevator? Can we pat, park in the back of the parking lot and walk in? Can we ride our bike to work? Uh, one of the initiatives that Megan's using right now. So simple things like that can have profound differences in your life. So You wanna hear my favorite one? I do. My favorite <laughs> challenge is to have people use a restroom on another floor. So if you're drinking enough water and you're well hydrated, it's a natural alarm clock to move. And we have um, lots of jobs where sometimes we'll sit down on a project and we're literally hunched over and we'll look up and it's been hours and we have not moved. So hopefully that's that alarm clock. And if you can take that as an exercise break, so go up a flight or down a flight, take a few stretches, a few deep breaths, things like that, those flights of stairs really add up. So if you go to the restroom five times a day at the end of the week, you've done an extra 25 sets of stairs. At the end of you know the month, that's 500 sets of stairs. And wow. the stairs are cheap, easy. You don't change clothes. You don't break a sweat. You can go at your own pace. <laughs> So right. those things, you can even do that in your home. So, you know, we usually, here's the closest bathroom we run over, but if you can go upstairs or downstairs or across the hall, those little things add up. And that's really a part of the blue zones. It's not marathons. It's not, you know, trying to tell people that we have to do these extremes, although sometimes we're attracted to the extremes. Right, right. Um, it's really adding in more activity into our daily life. So I love the example from Japan. So in Japan, they eat um, on tatami mats and very low to the ground. So multiple times a day, you're lifting your own body weight up from the ground. 
Now imagine asking a 90 or 100 year old uh, person to do that in America. We would, we would never think in, that that would be a normal activity, but if you do it every day, you, those, those that ability usually doesn't atrophy. You, you're able to retain that much, much longer. Um, and so that's part of the Blue Zones is add in those activities of daily life and, and continue to challenge yourself in, in where some of our conveniences have uh, overwhelmed us so that we have um, we can go the whole day really without moving depending on um, your lifestyle. So we want to add back in the movement. Yeah. And it's not the marathon runners who are that healthy or living that long. It's the people who add an hour of non-stressful exercise a day. So mm -hmm. walking five miles a day is a great thing that they mentioned in the Blue Zones book, but it could be any kind of, of exercise that you, you can work into. It. And it can um, be broken yeah. up throughout right. the day. So maybe it's walking the dog. That's one of the other things that Blue Zones is. Those, right. those right. natural things that make us move. It can be, you know, gardening for a little while. It can be, you know, dancing in the kitchen while you're making dinner. You know, clean. There's a lot of things we do, but it just, it just all adds up to that, to that movement. It, it, it's a cumulative type approach. Yes, it, yes, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And, and I think so many people have the misconception that they have to get out and run three miles a day or right. waste or whatever. And what you're saying is that's not true. You're healthy, but that doesn't necessarily add to your life, to your uh, longevity of your life. So, uh, and because the stress of that much stress on your body from running a marathon is cumulative as well. Mm -hmm. So, everybody's different. I right. think that we struggle to find a one size fits all for everyone. And that's mm -hmm. you look around. We don't all have the same body types. We don't have. We're not wired the same. Some things that might be you know, um, stress relief to, to me or you might be stressful. So mm -hmm. there's so many different options out there, but when we go back to the things that we're going to be consistent with, they're usually very easy to do, mm -hmm. cheap. There's low barriers to those. So that's why walking and things like that, there's not, there, there's very little barriers to those. So, so those are the things you're going to be able to stick with over time. Con consistency is really the key to this right. longevity and equation. The people in the Blue Zone book work that into their daily lives because and this is, again, five separate regions throughout the, throughout the world. And these people have commonality where they have, they maybe walk a mile to the grocery store every day to get their fresh fruits and vegetables. So they don't walk, they don't eat. So, and they're okay with that. They walk a mile down, pick up their groceries, and they walk all the way back with it. So it's just built into their, their routine. Or maybe they spend an hour gardening in their garden. Or they spend an hour uh, watching their grandkids and playing with them at the park. So they're, they're built into your routine. So you don't really have to think about it as a chore. What, what do you think as a society we have become so adverse to, to walking? I mean, you'll, you'll see people in the parking lot of the department store, and they'll sit there. I, I've seen people sit there and let their car run for three or four minutes waiting for somebody to pull out rather than parking four I or know. five spaces over. I know. Yeah. What, what's I know. up with that? <laughs> my favorite meme now is about, it shows my parents, and it says, you know, when I was little, I had to walk uphill both ways in the snow. Yeah. The new one shows, you know, I, you know, somebody in their 40s saying, you know, when I was young, I didn't, I didn't have a remote control. I had to walk to the TV to turn it. <laughs> on so uh, so it's that's our culture yeah. now yeah. So. yeah yeah and that and that yeah. culture is something that we can change and that's about who is in our supportive environment right so um, you know if if I'm at work and dr. Gilson walks over to the elevator I will say hey don't you remember we're allergic to elevators like we take the stairs here we're Baptist employees those elevators are for our patients and our guests she does too and She's and and that's and, and doctors oh yeah yeah I, I just you know I forgot but you have to have those other supportive people in your life that are going to challenge you to do those, encourage you to do, the, do that. And it's a lot easier when the people around you all are like-minded and that this benefits all of us. I mean, health is really communal. Right. And, and I know that's a big factor in the, in the Blue Zones book, and we'll talk more about that as the show progresses along. Just interestingly enough, how, how, what kind of response have you received from, from your employees when you start talking about this? Are people receptive? Yeah, it's, they've been really receptive. I think sometimes we do have hard conversations that are focused really about on weight and some very, very scary sure. things in healthcare, and we try to be very um, gen gentle and sensitive about them. This is kind of a different approach. This is like, would you like to see your great great grandchildren? Mm -hmm. And people are like, yeah, I, I would. Would you know? And to consider that getting older can be the best years of your life. Um, and our county health rankings, one of the scores we have is is length of life. And mm -hmm. anyone who dies before age seventy five is considered a premature death. Wow. And if you think about that logically, let's say we work till 65 and then we retire. Well, we should get at least 10 years to enjoy uh, enjoy our life. And of course, we'd like that to be longer. But but that's really what we've set as the benchmark. So when you think about that of like, okay, we've worked hard. What would you like to see? What would you like to do with that 75th year? What do you want to do on your 75th birthday? What do you want to do on your 100th birthday? And just start thinking about that. I think it's a lot easier um, to, uh, to be excited about it and to get people motivated in that approach. It's a lot more fun to think about 
about what, uh, the vacation I'm going to take at 75 as opposed to I'm going to try to lose 10 pounds, so to speak. Exactly. Yes. exactly. Fascinating, yeah. interesting conversation we're having. We're talking about blue zones. We're talking about how people are learning to live longer, healthier, and more productive lives. And we'll continue this great conversation in just a couple of moments. You are watching In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're coming back in just a couple of moments. WSRE Public Television and the Escambia Elementary Principals Association congratulate these Shining Star Award recipients. These students were selected upon the basis of good citizenship and adherence to the core values adopted by the Escambia County School System. Equality, responsibility, integrity, respect, honesty, and patriotism. Congratulations to all of these outstanding students. You are watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our guests this evening, Megan McCarthy and Dr. Paul Glisson with Baptist Healthcare. Our topic, how to live a longer, healthy, healthier, I should say, and more productive life. You were talking a little bit about our metrics here in Northwest Florida. Um, we're not so healthy, huh? We're not so healthy. We're one of the least healthiest counties. And uh, I think I have this operating vision that I will say to anyone who will listen is that I think Pensacola can be the San Diego of the South. So we have a lot of the same, um, a lot of parallels. And what that really means, if you've never been to San Diego, or you don't have a context for that means, is that we're all accidentally healthier. You know, when you get off the plane in San Diego, you know, there's a lot of things that are um, kind of subconsciously pushing you towards health. Right. And that's how powerful our environment is. Sometimes we get caught up in this game of with health that it's really about individuals' willpower. And it really, it really depends on what environment you're in. So there's been a lot of um, studies about really health determined and what zip code you live in and those things. But I like to talk about workplace scenarios. So let's say you are really healthy and you're trying really hard to prevent diabetes. Okay. Your doctor's told you you're in a pre-diabetic state. And every Friday, your boss brings in donuts. And they just want you to feel loved and appreciated. And it goes back to our school days when we, we do well on a test and we get a, we get a piece of candy. Um, and so you happened that Friday, um, you were late for work, something happened with the kids, you skipped your breakfast that you had made the night before and you were all prepared and you walked in and you're starving and here is a big box of donuts. Right. <laughs> You're going to eat that donut. You might eat two. You might eat more than two. And, and, it, and it really wasn't your fault, right? right? But this is where that environment, if you had walked in and there was a bowl of nuts and some clementines, you would have been like, oh, great. You right. know, and you, right. you would have been able to do that. So I think we really need to consider health in pretty much every decision we make. When we're looking at our new building developments in Pensacola, when we're looking at, um, you know, our workplaces, when we're looking at our schools, when we're looking at our neighborhoods, really, we are impacted by those those subtle cues around us and the not so subtle cues um, and, and we talk about culture we have to make it cool to be healthy that's right. what san diego has going for it and here i think we were more likely to joke and tease about our unhealthiness right. um, i don't right. think those jokes are very funny <laughs> well certainly it, you know the, the south too yeah. is known for a lot of fried food and things of that nature so that just kind of perpetuates the, <laughs> the, yes, the situation yeah. right. um it, talking about diabetes and i keep going back to that but i know there's so many people who are affected by it and it, it is a major and i guess it's really ep epidemic right that's great are you more likely to be a diabetic if you're 
parents were diabetics, if it, it, or, or, or when it comes to type two diabetes, is it just all up to you as far as how do you control? Right, that brings up the question, is it nature or nurture? Right. And I think a lot of this we're finding out is a lot more uh, nature, what, what your environment is around. So if you're more likely to grow up in a household that eats out most of your meals, then that's the kind of the household you will you know, turn into as you get to an adult. So all those things are contributory to it as well. So, but if you're in a household that's more likely to cook every meal and have fresh fruits and vegetables from your own garden, mm -hmm. then that's that's the lifestyle of your environment that you're, you're raised in. This so, is how I challenge yeah, people, yeah. is that there are things that are in our control and outside of our control. We can't control our parents, you can't control your DNA. You are, you are, you have this body mm -hmm. and then all that you can do is control how you, how you live every day and you make about 220 decisions every day about what to eat every day and we can't stop eating you right, we have right, to eat right. and so those decisions about what to eat and when to eat it and whether to put salt on it and what to drink with it all those things you're making them every day so those are something within your control so you really your choices are you know do nothing about it mm -hmm. do nothing or to proactively again put your make yourself um, you know your health a priority and we have a lot of caregivers uh, that we work with and they are so phenomenal at their jobs but they're not very good at caring for themselves. And I really look at it as a sustainability issue because you cannot wake up every day, and at Baptist we say the always experience. You cannot wake up every day and give the always experience if you are not you know, nurturing and taking good care of yourself. And so sometimes, whether it's busy families and moms and dads and all those things, we have to make our own health a priority. It's, it's not easy, but it's worth it. Do you think, and I'll either one of you answer, answer this question, but has the, in the past, it, has the medical community to some degree, and maybe it's big pharmaceutical companies more so than, than actual doctors, have they been, um, shall we say, guilty in pushing the easy solution in that take this pill? Absolutely. Absolutely. We find that a lot of interactions with patients and doctors, if rather than prescribing medicine, if they would be able to spend 30 minutes with you. What if your doctor spent an hour with you and really went over your diet and talked about some of the things that are in the Blue Zones book with you and said, these are really health, st health style changes you can make for yourself. How amazing would that be if you had that much time to spend with somebody who could really coach you up to that? It's just our society's really moved to where it's, nope, just take this prescription and let's move on because right. it's easier. Uh, and that's certainly how you get reimbursed in the, in the medical field these days. So. Uh, and I do see a lot of patients who say, well, my, you know, I, you know, I had a stroke. I, I saw a patient last night who had very, he was 19, had very high blood pressure already. And he says, well, you know, my mom had blood pressure, my dad had high blood pressure. And then I you know, ask about this and they've all had strokes at early ages. And, and I ask them, well, what have, you, what have you done about that? And they say, well, you know, nothing I can do about it. It's my family. Uh, but the interesting thing that's in the Blue Zone book is that these things are not really genetically based. If you look at the things that are going on in the Blue Book, they don't ever say, well, you come from a long line of people who live to be 200 years old. That, that's not what they say. All these people uh, had these commonalities of their habits of how they actually live their life. And what's interesting is that they've studied the people who move from a blue zone. So maybe you lived in Okinawa, but you moved to Canada or you moved to Florida. But if you kept those same habits, you still had the longevity um, experience that, that, that you would have if you stayed in Okinawa. So get away from the fact that it's genetics. It, it is way more important to worry, to worry about your environment and the choices that you make. So, so what you're saying is there may be a teeny tiny amount of certain things, certain diseases or whatever that may be genetic, Correct. but so much of it is your environment and Correct. that you can control it. Now, here's the other question. I, I, I'm taking from you guys, you don't have to do all of this overnight. It can, it can, gra you, so you right. can gradually, so maybe, you know, you stop eating sweets, you know, if you eat every day, maybe you only have dessert, you know, five That's times right. a week as opposed to seven, right? That's that, right. Does that make a difference? Absolutely. That's what I've done in my family. We, we sat down recently and talked about our diet and we said, we eat meal not every day, we eat it three times a day. So what we're doing, and we're eating mostly meat diet, so I challenge them, let's sit down and let's read this book as a family and let's find out the small changes we can do and let's do a 30-day challenge on how we can really improve this and really move to more uh, a vegetarian and fruit-based diet with some meat sprinkled in there. And my family's been really receptive to it. They're like, okay, let's let's talk about it. And it's really been a great conversation starter for us. So uh, we challenge everybody to do that. Yeah, I think, you know, we have a lot of research on nicotine cessation and quitting smoking. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, one way to quit smoking is to go, go, go cold turkey and just right. quit. And then there's other methods of uh, using a tool to support that or a taper down method. So what we've seen over the time, the highest 
success rate is in doing it with supportive groups or with those tools or with you know a champion, which may be your physician. Um, the least effective way is cold turkey. Now that doesn't mean that some people can do it cold turkey, um, and certainly you get better every time you quit. But the same thing goes for almost any behavior change. So again, we're looking at the long game. I mean, literally the long game. Wow. So we're looking at what small changes can we make that you can be consistent with. Um, we call them swap opportunities, right? So if we look at a, a food, uh, a food, a diet, a meal plan that you're waking and we can say, you know, we could swap this out for this. Um, you may find something you love and it sticks and then you may say, oh, that one doesn't work for me. And you move on, but you keep getting better as you go on. Um, and then when you look back over time, you've, I said, accidentally gotten healthier. You haven't necessarily wow. had to, um, you know, do anything extreme. It's just that you have hardwired in these different changes that have, have led you down a healthier path. And, and, and as I understand it, and you're the doctor, so you know better than I do, but I mean, if, if I'm living a pretty healthy life and occasionally I want to have a big ice cream sundae, uh, that's okay, right? That is absolutely okay. We encourage that. So. Okay. So, what yeah. you do every day is much more powerful right. than what you do every once in a while. <clears throat> yep. So for most of us, if we have a great routine Monday through Friday, right? So that's when some of us are in work or school. We have a, a structure. Most people don't expect Tuesday morning breakfast to rock their world. They right. just want some fuel. They want to get out the door, all those things. Well, if we can keep that pretty consistent and pretty strong, then on the weekends, you have some more freedom to have that ice cream, to right. do the other things. But when we look back, um, and Dr. Gilson will love this because it's about data, right? So you look back and you did something once a week. Well, okay. So when you look back at the whole year, you know, man, maybe some weeks you forgot. So you did that, did that something that you consider bad or cheating 50 times. But if you're not keeping track, you're more, much more likely to go to get ice cream on a Tuesday or Thursday and you look back and you had, you did that, that behavior 150 times. So again, when we can keep those things, if you can keep a good routine for most days, then it gives you that flexibility on the weekends when you can really like enjoy food and you have the time to actually, you know, do more, go for more walks or do other activities. Um, so that's where we try to create that balance. And sometimes it's hard for people to understand what that really means. But again, the work week or the school week is usually a great way to get a good routine and good structure in place. You mentioned Tuesday morning breakfast. Is breakfast really the most important meal of the day? Well, the, the Blue Zone book, they, they have a saying, they say you should eat breakfast like a king, uh, you should eat lunch like a prince, and you should eat dinner like a pauper. So it really, that's when you're doing most of your activity in the day, so it's, yeah. it's more important. At least they found that the, the, patient, the people who are in the Blue Zones here, have, they all, again, have this commonality of where they all have that habit there. And I would so, suggest that most of us in this country do just the opposite, don't exactly. we? Exactly. We do. What time do you go to bed on average? Uh, midnight. Okay. So basically, <laughs> you know, here. you're you are fasting. <laughs> Your body is fasting from midnight. So let's say you ate dinner at 8 p.m. and then mm -hmm. you didn't eat before midnight. So you had four hours there. And then your alarm goes off at six, seven, those kind of so you essentially are almost going 12 hours without giving your body any fuel. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you were awake for 12 hours and didn't give your body any fuel. You'd be cranky, you'd be irritable, mm -hmm. your, mm -hmm. your process time would be slower. Your metabolism when you're sleeping is kind of like hibernating. So right. you're, you're like a computer that's in hibernation mode. You get the keys and it revs back up. So it's really important in the morning to eat. I would say within the first 30 minutes um, to, you know, to, to wake up all your systems, including your brain. And this is important for kids, really important for kids to eat breakfast. Um, and and then I think that we get that for kids and we're like, oh, we got to make sure everybody's right. kiddos right. eat breakfast. Right. We turn 18 and we're like, no, I don't need breakfast. I'm going to have, you know, I'm, I'm going to skip breakfast. I don't need it anymore. But there's not a whole lot of difference between 18 and 19. And as we get older, we're just big versions of our kids' right. selves in a lot of ways. I don't think a Red Bull counts as breakfast. <laughs> in fact, talk about diabetes, your pancreas should be screaming at you if you're drinking that Red Bull for breakfast. I, I can imagine. Well, is there any particular... Um, uh, menu we should have for breakfast? I mean, as far as what should our protein mix be versus, you know, fruit, so on and so forth. They talk a lot about whole grains and nuts and berries and things uh, like that that have protein, but yet um, contribute to a ba more balanced diet there. So I won't go too are, crazy on the nutrition are. piece, but there's really only three macronutrients in our food that we're looking for is fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And ideally, you want to get all three. Right, okay. so you don't want to eat just one thing, even if it is a big, delicious piece of fruit. That's going to give you, um, you know, if it's got the peel on it, some fiber and some fructose, some natural fruit sugar, some carbohydrates. But you really need some protein. So it's very easy to do that. So like if you had an apple, the 
peel is all fiber, inside is that natural fruit sugar, and then you had uh, 13 almonds or walnuts or you know peanut butter or something like that, which is gonna have the healthy fat, the fat that comes from a plant or a nut versus fat that comes from an animal, and you're gonna get some more fiber. So you're getting all three macronutrients. It's gonna help you feel full. It helps put less stress on your heart and your pancreas and all those things, um, and that's what is really what we're trying to do. So snacking is when you eat one only one macronutrient so that's like your twizzlers it's all sugar right, right. and so your glycemic index as we're talking about um, diabetes and things it is easier when you're eating it's easier on your body when you eat it with those other things like protein and and fiber for your digestion the overall process so i won't go too far in it but you really want to get that's what did your grandmother say eat a balanced meal right right okay, that's what really what we're trying to go for is is balance so but i would say but that back in some, my grandmother's day that was fried chicken and <laughs> <laughs> dumplings <laughs> and bacon and all that kind of but stuff. But it was all homemade. But it was That's all right. homemade. So there wasn't any chemicals or processing. It was made with love in the kitchen. So. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Great conversation we're having on this edition of In Studio. We are learning how to be uh, healthier and, and live a longer life with something called the Blue Zones concept. As we got a break, here's some advice on eating healthy from a gentleman who is 100 years old and lives and works, lives and works, I said, right here in Pensacola, Florida. His name is Joe Brown. Take a look at what he has to say as we continue on with this edition of In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast, back in just a couple of moments. Okay. So what kind, of, what kind of diet do you have? Do you eat very healthy? Uh, yeah, I, I try to eat healthy. and uh, I've been eating uh, cereal for breakfast. I guess for 50 years, uh -huh. and I mix wheat germ, oatmeal, uh, all brown. Do you eat a lot of meat? I don't. I don't eat. I eat some, but not a lot of meat. Not a lot of meat. Now I'm sure you got some bad habits. You must cheat or something. Sugar, or what? No, I. Uh, I put honey in my cereal every morning. Honey. Okay. Just had your hundredth birthday. Yeah, yeah, eleventh of March. She liked that. You got it. Somebody runs the meat and keeps it on track. Well, that's. And I heard to celebrate, you came to work and cut hair. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So, how old were you when you started uh, cutting hair? Well, actually, I started cutting hair on the back porch at home, cutting my younger brother's hair. Uh -huh. And uh, what I would be, I would, I'd be the layperson. Yeah. People found out I, could, I was cutting his hair, and then the neighbors started coming, and I, and I was, I started cutting about when I was about 14 years old. Oh wow! Living a longer healthier and more meaningful life. That is our topic this evening on In Studio, right here on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our guests are Megan McCarthy and Dr. Paul Glisson, both with Baptist Healthcare. What a fascinating story. So you're down there getting your hair cut by a gentleman who is 100 years old, still yes, working. What an amazing story. He is, he doesn't miss a beat. So uh, he, he comes to keep himself healthy and keep working. So, and we met Joe through uh, uh, Megan, uh, Megan's shop there, she uh, 
works with Joe's great granddaughter, who is a diabetic uh, educator for us here. Mm -hmm. wow. And she told us basically, you have to come down and talk to our, my great grandfather because he is really living the blue zones. So the amazing thing about meeting Joe is that Joe has not read this book. Like I didn't prep him with these right. answers to come here. So as I interviewed Joe and I spent about an hour with him, he basically read the book back to me. <laughs> All the nine lessons, when I asked him that, like, what kind of diet do you eat? He, you know, he gives me the answer right out of the book. So he is following this without knowing it, but I mean, he's basically proving the theory that's in the blue zones that these things really do add up. So it was really, it was, it was amazing for me because afterwards I was like, did someone Rep, Mr. Brown, because he had the exact same answers without, you know, it was pretty amazing. I was speechless for a while there. So, um, yeah. So his great granddaughter works with you. Yeah, it, Rachel Miller. She's our our, our, clinic, our clinical manager, and um, and that's how you know we had when we we started. When I first read this book, I thought, how many people do we think we have in Pensacola that are 100 years old? And I, I thought I started asking around, and we have um, some different programs and things. And I, I was really trying to see locally, you know, where how should we set a goal? Should we, you know, what that looks like? Now, obviously, as we're most people don't wake up at 90 and say I'm going to make 100. They are doing things back when they're 20s, 30s, and I always say we're all in the healthy aging game. Right. It doesn't right. really matter if you're, you know, 20 nothing trying to be healthy at 30 or 16 to 70. We're all looking. We all want to retain, um, you know, our energy level and feel good and all those things. So um, when we start talking about this, Rachel, you know, volunteered that. Um, and I think it's actually her grandfather or her great-grandfather. I can't remember. Great-grandfather. Is it her great-grandfather? Great-grandfather. Okay. Wow. He looks so young. I keep thinking I'm <laughs> like, you know. It, and that's what really is amazing. And I think it's so motivating to see, um, to see that, you know, living longer can be, can be really great. Yeah, and how important is it to continue working or continuing to do something that is, you know, besides just playing golf, so to speak? Right. That's one of the big lessons and one of the most important ones to me in the book is that uh, and they, they talk about this in Okinawa, where, where Megan used to live there, but everyone there that's this age, they have, uh, and pronounce it, Megan, you're... Ikigai. She's, she's got the dialect down. <laughs> I have a country <laughs> accent, but... Uh, the, Say with the, the country accent. Yeah, the Ikigai. So <laughs> they have a reason for getting up every day. Like, why am I getting up? Why am I... What's my purpose for living? They all have a great answer. They don't say, well, I'm just going to get up and take my medicine today and watch Jeopardy. Right. They say, I'm going to take care of my grandkids, or I still, I'm still working. Or like Mr. Brown, I'm sure what he didn't say this, but I'm sure he's like, I gotta go down and find out what the gossip is in Pensacola yeah. <laughs> because that's what you know barbers are really great at doing is getting in the mix of things there. So everybody has a reason for getting up and they still either work or they have to garden or they have family members to take care of. And you see a lot of communal families where the grandchildren, the great grandchildren, they all have this hierarchy where they, they contribute to each other's lives. So um, that's the most important part. It's been said that the two most dangerous years of your life are your first year of life when you have mm -hmm. a lot of um, there's a lot of zero to one um, health conditions, and then the year you retire. The year you retire. Right, which and, is so counterintuitive. Yeah. yeah, why is that? Well, you lose your structure. In some cases, you might lose your purpose. Um, I think in some ways, sometimes you you go do things that you haven't done a long way, whether it's a, a you know a physical uh, endeavor or things like that that might create some more accidents. But it's really you have to kind of reinvent yourself in a lot of ways, depending on when and how you how you do retire. But we need to think about that. Um, you know, as in, in that long-term approach to health. Well, I, I guess a, a, a prime example would would be the uh, late great college football coach Paul Bear Bryant. If you remember that, right. I mean, he was for so long, you know, obviously the you know revered in the state of Alabama and, and, and right. th throughout the college football ranks, and retired yeah. and died shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. You hear those stories all the time, and there's definitely something to it. Yeah. But some people are going to say, "Hey, you know what? I." I don't like working for this company. I don't like working for this person or whatever, and I'm retiring as soon as I possibly can. So what's, what's your advice for them? I mean, go find another job. Find, you no, know, you got to find something else that you're into, something else important to you. Maybe it's a family member or getting more involved in your church or more getting involved in a, a hobby, <clears throat> something else you're into, or more maybe it's more exercise. So you got to find a real reason that defines you, and I hope that people don't look at themselves, well, I'm the accountant for this, or I'm the doctor for this, or I'm the lawyer for this. They hope they say that I'm, that I'm a dad, that I'm uh, helping my children through college, that uh, I'm a member of my church choir. I've got these other things that really define me and focus on those parts. Yeah, I've heard a lot of folks uh, say, you know, they're going to retire, you know, from their vocation and, and go pursue their avocation. Yes, right. so, absolutely. Know, that, that type of approach, good thing to do. Um, 
and I guess it's probably also if, if you've always thought about you know doing something that's kind of outside you know your your area of expertise, maybe mm -hmm. writing a book or something like right. that. What a, what a what a great opportunity to do uh, to do that when you when you move into retirement. But anyway, Mr. Brown. Um, Wow, what a, what a what an absolutely Amazing. great great story that is. Talk about some of the other things in blue zones that uh, people are doing. We we we've talked about we've talked about the food. We've talked about uh, working longer mm -hmm. and how important that is. We have um, you know we've talked about uh, uh, exercising and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, it's also kind of important who you hang out with, right? Yeah, that tribe, uh, for lack of a better word. But we're very influenced by by those around us, and uh, so you know, creating, filling your life with people that are going to be positive and supportive of your health and that, that will help you, um, you know, stick to those, to those health goals and care about you are really, really important. And that can look differently in people's words, but that, that tribe and that supportive environment are really powerful. Right. The people in Okinawa, I mean, they're, there's the, the people they interview there are a hundred, but every day they get together with their friends, they sit on their mats in a circle, and they gossip about what's going on in the community, and they really have this, this tribal, you know, or communal sense where they, they to draw strength from each other based on this community there. So I like to use it when I'm wanting to go out with my friends at night and I tell my wife, you know, I, when I'm getting the tribe together, it's very important <laughs> to my health. I want to live to be 100, That's work right. with me on this. Yeah. But I think it is important to have a close group of friends that you really are, you can relate to and you can draw strength and support from. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there any research or data that would indicate whether you're married or single increases your lifespan? Well, that's a hot topic and a little touchy. Um, I think there's some there's some research out there that says... Uh, depends you know, on who you're married to. Well, yeah. it depends on who you're married to. And, uh, and that men fare better than women. But but again, that partnership um, is very helpful. And that family unit can look in a lot of different ways. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, what we consider like a marriage that makes you live longer, but um, but certainly having that support. So even in multi-generational families, um, there's a lot of studies going on now about success of the grandchildren in the home, you know, those, those, that, how we look at our elders and things like that. And certainly in areas like Japan, there's a lot of reverence and respect. Um, you know, getting older is uh, very, uh, very important and, right. and, um, and we've, we've seen that way. So I, you know, I always say we need to bring some street cred back to getting to 100. You know, <laughs> right. I want Mr. Brown to be our local celebrity. Um, right. I know in England, when you turn 100, you get a letter from the Queen. Oh, wow. So okay. maybe um, Mayor Hayward will start writing. 100 year birthday cards and we can you know uh, make it cool again and, and aspirational well remember the um, uh, today show weatherman Willard Scott yes. who used to always right. you know right. recognize the, the folks who were yeah. you know I yeah. guess 100 yeah. or so exactly so. They, they mentioned in the book there like in Okinawa there are very few nursing homes mm -hmm. how about that <laughs> talking, about, talking about treating our elders yeah. there's no need for nursing homes because they take care of their family so right. it's the one-off person who doesn't have a family that might need elder care but for the most part they would absorb that into their family they take care of each other there so the same thing in Sardinia where they talk, talk about there where there are no nursing homes basically mm -hmm. the community of your town would take care of you so and look at our at our community so right. my dad is 90 and he talks all the time about you're never gonna put me in a nursing home <laughs> and, I, and I kid with him but he's right he's he's not going to a nursing home he has a strong family unit and we're gonna take care of him there but right. I still get to hold that over his head but, uh, a little bit. But, uh, um, so, uh, but yeah, that's the way we treat our elders. They're much more revered in these societies than we do. And I think uh, the biggest part of discrimination in our society, and Megan and I have talked about this before, we've talked a lot about discrimination with different age groups, right? I mean, sorry, with different ethnic groups. But no one really talks about age discrimination. And they are the one population that is still blatantly dis discriminated against yeah. on lots of different issues right. there. So, And when you look at them, you think, oh, well, you know, grandpa, get out of the way, kind of thing. You know, you're you're my way. But really, in these communities, they are revered, and they would stop if they saw if they saw Mr. Brown in the street. Everyone in town would stop and talk to him, okay. and and pay him respect. Whereas here, people are more like, "Come on, I, I'm, getting, I'm trying to get around you in traffic or whatever." Right, so, right, so it's right. a whole different community uh, approach to it. Although I will say, it does seem like, to some degree, perhaps on the national uh, level, from a celebrity standpoint or from a um, uh, perhaps a business standpoint, you're starting to hear about more and more chief executive officers and people like that who are working well into their 70s or even 80s. Um, I was surprised, uh, well, he recently passed away, but a Morley Saver, who had been on 60 Minutes yes. for such a long, long yeah. time, was apparently active right up, right up in, to the end. Yeah. So that's right. you know that's that's a prime example, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's the benefit of. Us living longer lives but I always say you know all of us are just as important as our CEOs or as our Olympic athletes but imagine if we took care of ourselves to the degree that they do wow. you know our Olympic athletes are not eating pop-tarts for breakfast right 
fight. You know, the University of Alabama football team didn't need five hours of <laughs> So if we held ourselves to that standard, like I am just as important, my role in healthcare, my role, um, you know, my job at Gulf Power, or, you know, is just as important to my community and my family as this Olympic athlete or our celebrities. Right. I mean, that's a really different uh, way of looking at taking care of ourselves. Um, so I, I really challenge people to think about it in that frame. And what would you do? Can you take elaborately good care of yourself? Right. And what does right. that look like for you? Right. Well, I remember the um, the great motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar, and I'm, right. I'm going to butcher this up a little bit, but <laughs> but he said something to the effect, he said, if you had a horse that was running in the Kentucky Derby, you wouldn't take him out the night before and fill him full of beer and have him smoking <laughs> cigars all night, would you? <laughs> you wouldn't. You would not. You would not. And I, I think that leads into another big piece about the Bozones is, um, is stress. Yeah. I mean, you know, stress is so uh, powerful, and, you know, we can cope with a lot of it. And we have, um, lots of us have different jobs that, you know, may put you on a 10, whether you're a physician or a firefighter and there's jobs. But um, we're seeing like some chronic impact to that that long-term exposure to really high stress. And so um, we challenge people sometimes to think about stress on a, a scale to one to 10. Mm -hmm. uh, in the hospital, we use a pain scale very frequently. So if you've ever been in the hospital, we will ask you, you know, self, um, you know, self-perceived pain, give us a number so we can help help you with that. So think, imagine if we asked about stress every day and I said, okay, what's your stress level one to 10? And you may have a days that are an eight or a nine, just mm -hmm. a really stressful right, day. Right. But your ability to get yourself like below a three, at least for some time during each day, now maybe that's the very end of the day with a prayer or meditation, maybe that's a hot shower, maybe that is a run, maybe that's a phone call to a loved one. I mean, that can look differently, but you've got to be able to get yourself below that um, and make it into your daily routine. Let's talk more about that when we come back because Ted, our director, is stressing right okay. now. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna hear from some more from uh, Mr. Joe Brown, who's 100 years old right here in our community. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're coming back in just a few moments. So, what's been your secret for living so long? Not only living well, so long, but being active still. Well, what I tell people, I joined the church. In 1963, uh -huh. and the Lord does a better job than I was doing. That's why I'm still here. Okay, I, I see. I agree. <laughs> I get down there. Full church starts every Sunday morning. I, I give out the bulletins and meet people and greet them and uh -huh. all that. Gotcha. And uh, they all hug my neck and tell me how much they enjoy. Uh huh. And it makes me feel good. Right. <laughs> uh, What advice would you give people who want to live to be a hundred? What advice? Yeah. Well, it keep on doing something. Stay active. Don't sit in. Right. Get up in the right. morning and do something. Right. Right. That sounds good to me. Yeah. Most people today don't get any exercise. I mean, they're as big as from here. That's why I'm still working. I think you have to. They say if you don't use it, you lose it. So. Right. I'm trying to keep on using it. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Is that why you kind of still cut hair? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I ain't doing it because I need the money. I'm doing it because I'm trying to help my health. Right.
Seen some great clips. Mr. Joe Brown, who is a resident here in Northwest Florida, 100 years old, and he is still working. Fits very nicely with what we're talking about tonight, living a longer, healthier, more productive life. And on this edition of In Studio, our guests are Megan McCarthy and Dr. Paul Glisson, both with Baptist Healthcare, and we're talking about the Blue Zones concept. One of the things that we were talking about as we went to break was stress. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Give me some ideas on how we can keep from getting stressed out, and then when we do get stressed out, how we can deal with it in a productive way. Right. Well, stress itself is not bad. I mean, we're going to have stress. So the goal of trying to eliminate stress is stressful. So that, yeah. that's really not the approach. <laughs> that's not the approach we want to go to. We're going to have stress in our lives. And, you know, that's through the life cycle. Even if you have something that works for maybe um, when you're younger, it's, it's going to change over time. So you do have to find those coping mechanisms. Um, and that's where, you know, family support um, can certainly help and, and some spirituality and all those things. You There isn't one size fits all. I think the first step is being aware of it. And that's why that scale to one to ten is really, I think, a helpful tool to just be aware of it and start mm -hmm. paying attention. Um, and so then you can see, um, you know, be more aware of what things are stressing you out. How long does it take you to wind down? Some people, you know, wind down with being around other people and that's maybe like a church format or things like that. Other people um, can wind down um, doing things more individually. Um, certainly exercise can be a tremendous stress relief. And people, when they think of exercise, if they think of they have one thing in their mind and say, well, I'm not an athlete. Well, that has nothing to do with exercise in my mind. So whether that's uh, yoga or whether that's walking or, you know, sometimes something like a racquetball or tennis, you know, some, you know, physical aggression, there's a lot of different ways. And so that can be um, a really great way. Stress also really translates into sleep. Mm. And sleep is another really, really powerful um, factor in our lives that I, I think we underestimate in general. Right, We're, right. We don't get a lot of sleep and we brag about it. Right. Like, oh, I only got four hours sleep last night. Right. That is not a good thing. Right, um, right. And so, again, I go back to the kids. You know, when if you have little ones, they take a bath, they read a book that, you know, a day, it's an hour long process or more. Same thing. Before An hour before we really want to be asleep, you should get away from screens, TV, phone, all those things. You need to create a rit ritual. So maybe it is hot tea, maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's reading a book, maybe it's that hot shower so that then you can fall asleep easily and have a higher quality sleep. And certainly um, there's that quality issue and then there's the quantity, but you have to build it in. And, and if you decide tonight you're gonna go to bed at 8 p.m., that's probably not gonna work. You need to move up your bedtime. Like you, midnight, we should aim for 11.30 first, right, see if yeah, we right. can get you there. Right. That's not so healthy, Jeff. We need to work on you. <laughs> well, well, I don't so, get up as so. early as you think I might. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I mean, I don't want. I'm not trying. Well, I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying that you know, we we if we're honest with ourselves when that is, or if we create such a sleep debt during the week and then yeah. we try to sleep in till noon, um, that also throws off our sleep schedule. And right. you know, you may someday that may not work. I just see people say, I just I can't sleep in anymore. I'm up at my same right. routine and your body is looking for that rhythm and that, that routine. That, that's not a problem for me. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ideally, ideally, how many hours of sleep should we get? Well, in the book, they talk about that. There's people, the people in the, they were interviewed in the book there, they get between seven and nine hours of sleep. And okay. that's, that's across the board. So okay. when you go below that, you are really, you're really cheating yourself. And like Megan says, everyone's wired a little bit yeah. differently. And right. you certainly hear of people who only need three or four hours of sleep a night, but that is way, way not the norm. So uh, you should plan on at least seven hours of sleep to be healthy. I, I wanna, um, as, as we get towards the end of the broadcast here, um, I want to put up the list of uh, things that we've been talking about, and we'll just kind of go back over each one of these and kind of have you guys sort of expand yeah. on, on how important they are. This is all about the Blue Zones concept, and, and, and what they have basically found is that folks are living longer, healthier, more productive lives if they follow this sort of approach. So one of the things we talked about at the very beginning of the program, move naturally. Expand on what you mean by that or what they mean by that. Yeah. We were just saying, you know, not necessarily marathons, natural movement, taking the stairs, activities of daily life, you know, don't use conveniences, you know, hide your remote in the couch for a night and get up and those kind of things so that you're getting uh, more activity throughout the day. Yep. Walk to the grocery store instead of driving two minutes down the road. Yeah. So. yeah and then find a purpose. Which is yeah. great. It's, you know, it's why you wake up and whether it's that's to be a great parent or to be a great community member or your job or all of those things. And they may change throughout your life, but to have to know what that is and be connected to right. it. And then downshift. That's a stress. So that's knowing yeah. going, being able to go from high stress to low stress. 
and being in control of that at various points of your day. So at least at some point during yeah. each day, you are in that downshifted, low yeah. stress gear. Find some time to meditate too, or else spend time in religious activities there. That's that's very prominent in the blue zones. 80% mm -hmm. rule, what is that? We didn't talk about that one. That's, this one comes from How'd Japan. You miss that I don't know, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> so in Japan, they have a phrase, Hari Hachibu, uh -huh. and it means basically to stop eating when you're 80% full. Okay, okay. So, you know, some, People don't, you know, we, we know what hunger feels like, like I'm starving, and then we know what Thanksgiving full feels like. Right, right. And really we want to be closer to that 80% of that full feel. So that I always challenge myself, well, okay, after dinner, could I go run a mile? Or does physical activity sound good? And, and um, there's another phrase in Japanese, which is basically to take um, 100 steps after dinner. So sometimes if we eat a meal and we go straight to bed, you know, for digestion and things like that, it's it's spacing out, building in the activity with the food. Another activity they do in, in Okinawa is they make the plate beforehand and then put the food away. Gotcha. So if you if eat family style, all the food everywhere, you will go back for seconds. It's very easy to reach for another pork chop off the plate. But if you've already put the food away, yep. you're stuck. So and eat on time, smaller so plates because okay. our brains yeah. are easily tricked. I'm getting tight on time, so I want to get through. Plant, yep. slant, eat beans. Yep. Make a system for meat, so whether you do meatless Mondays once a week, if you eat meat just at dinner, um, try to look at how we reshift that balance of our meals being centered around the big piece of meat and said be centered on vegetables. Okay, and then meat in moderation, so that kind of falls in line with yep. what you were saying. Shared spiritual practice, I've got two minutes. <clears throat> We talked about that one a little bit, is find find a connection to um, your, you know, mind, body, soul, health. So that's that's a church. Um, some people find it in nature, um, but it's really important to have that, that connection. Okay, and loved ones first. Yeah. That's how we treat our elders, that's right, mm -hmm. and uh, revering them and bringing the elders into our uh, communal space at home. And then right tribe. Surround yourself with people that are supportive and care for you and care for your health and they're willing to be your champions and motivators and you return it back to them. All right, very good. Fascinating conversation this evening. I hope uh, hope our viewers learned a lot. I know I learned a lot. And I would expect that we're gonna see more and more about this through Baptist Healthcare as you guys push towards uh, Northwest Florida being a blue zone, huh? Mm -hmm. And the great yeah. thing is we, Baptist put about a thousand copies of these books in town. So um, most people know someone who works at Baptist. We're the largest employer. So if you can ask a Baptist, um, a friend or neighbor if they had the blue zones and they can get yourself a copy of the book you can read the book for yourselves there's also a ted talk um, that dan yes. butner did and it's great and it gives a great um talks about a lot about the stuff we did here um, and that's an easy way to access some of the blue zones information and on top of that if, the, if if folks would like to share this particular program they can do so we will be on youtube here in a few days i'm sure and also on the wsre uh, dot org site as well Megan McCarthy, thank you so very much. Dr. Paul Glisson, thank you so very much. Thank, thank all of you for watching. As, uh, as It's been a great show. We've learned an awful lot. Our guests have been Megan McCarthy and Dr. Paul Glisson, both with Baptist Healthcare. They are leading the charge to make Northwest Florida a blue zone, a place where residents live longer, healthier, and more meaningful lives. I hope you are one of those folks. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. We certainly hope you enjoyed this broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself. Eat well, sleep you know, exercise, do that kind of stuff. We'll see you soon. Thank you for watching.